So actually, first I'll talk about Matana. I've never been to Matana before. I just got here yesterday. What a fantastic city, unbelievable history. The first thing I did was I called my wife. I took a selfie, posted it on Twitter, did a couple Snapchats. All right, wow, 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 let's go. I'm really excited for TEDx, my first TEDx, really excited. And then I did a live stream on uh, Periscope. Got about 2,000 followers, people saying, what's Matera like? What's the history? I'm like, oh, I don't know. I've never been here before. I mean, I've read stuff. but So it was a conversation. It was, a, it was an exploration together. Let's go around this corner and see what happens. Now, luckily, there are people from here that wanted to have that conversation that did show me around, got me to the other side by the Duomo, got to my, uh, my accommodations, and I picked up a lot of information along the way, and it was a great way to get introduced to Matera. Now, I'm back in Rome, and uh, think about a tourist. Think about a tourist coming to Rome. What do they know about Rome? Well, they probably don't know very much. And where are they all going to go? In the limited time that they actually stay in Rome, about two days on average, they go to the Vatican. They're going to go to the Colosseum. These are kind of no-brainers. If you don't have much time, you got to see the best stuff, check it off the bucket list, go to these places. How much of the rest of the city are you going to explore? You're going to go to these places, get to the top of the list, they're famous. This is the world's most famous iconic monument in the world. But there's so much more to see. There's so much more in between those two axes. There's so much more to, to experience. And if you walk around in your limited time in Rome, you'll come across the world's greatest, uh, best preserved uh, Roman temple, the Pantheon, which is saved because it becomes a church, also very well built. Maybe you'll see uh, Castle San Angelo, the mausoleum of the emperors in the second century AD. It becomes a castle of the popes. It's recycled, it's reutilized. Maybe you'll see this newly cleaned, newly restored Pyramid of Cestius, 2,000 years old, that then gets incorporated into the Arelianic wall circuit in the third century AD. Then part of the wall is busted through so cars can drive by in the modern era. But it's so hard to get a sense of ancient Rome because Rome is never abandoned. People are always living there. We all know that. So you, know, you might see this and say, that's Piazza Navona. And I can say, well, I, as an archaeologist, I see the Stadium of Domitian underneath. It gives it that great shape. You see the Trevi Fountain. Everyone knows the Trevi Fountain, but there were other fountains of Trevi in that same spot. And they're utilizing an ancient aqueduct, the Aqua Virgo, that's still in use over 2,000 years. There's lots of history. There are lots of bits and pieces of ancient Rome that we can't really see. So one way I propose just briefly is to take uh, a little stroll through Rome. Let's take the path of the Roman triumph. Now, and essentially, what is the Roman triumph? It's the ultimate thing that you could do as a Roman general or as a Roman emperor here, Septimius Severus. You get to be God for a day. That's pretty good. And at the end of the day, they have a big banquet on the Capitoline Hill, everyone celebrating with you, and then that's it, you go back home. So it's just that one day, the ultimate spotlight, you're going to be immortalized. And you're also going to be immortalized by what you built. And over time, along that route, can, that can change over time. You're going to be tapping to something really great. You're underlining how great Rome is, how great you are, how, how great the state is. So we can't all go around in a chariot every day. I would, I would like to do that in Rome, but you can't. It's out from the countryside. But we can use art. We can use the literary sources. We can use the monuments themselves. And we can get a sense of what that pageantry was about. Here are soldiers carrying the menorah brought back in from the wars in Judea. Here are some soldiers with captives that they're carrying all kinds of trophies. Here are some soldiers, some, of them are, some musicians are blowing trumpets, sacrificial victims, because you're going to have a big barbecue at the end of this, at the end of this procession. And of course, by the time things get really big, you're competing against people that came before you, you're trying to supersede them, your procession, your captive soldiers, your soldiers that are having all of their regalia and their armor, they're being allowed to come in through the city. So somewhere in the Campus Martius, the big floodplain of Rome, basically the historic center, you're getting permission from the Senate to come in and to organize 
and to start that procession through the city to have your great day. So you have to have won a great victory, but you also have to have had great lobbying going on within the Senate in the Republican times. Otherwise, when there are emperors, well, of course, you're going to get a triumph for the emperor. So this little thing was dug up from the layers of Rome and then stuck into a wall. And maybe it's just you know, commonly used as a, as a didactic lesson or from a Latin teacher, but at the bottom it says, penultimate line, pomerium. So that's the sacred boundary line you're allowed to penetrate through and start going on your way in your procession. One of the things that you'll see is temples in a pit, but they all line up. There are four temples there. And we want to think about this. I mean, I live there every day. I live around the corner from here. I, I want to see it in a brand new way every single day. Is it just if I'm doing a live stream and I'm talking with people, they want to see the cats. Is it a cat sanctuary? Is it a neglected site? Is it a place that when it does get open to the public because it's been restored, is it going to be a, there's going to be a new perception? So over time, these monuments are created meaning they're not just there in happenstance. They're built one by one over a period of three centuries all along that processional route. This one here, Temple A in particular, is well preserved because it becomes a church. But over time, it loses its use. It's incorporated into other structures. And then what happens is it disappears over time. Until, until renovation, until new urbanization, in this case in the 1920s. And we have it like this today. Now, moving along further south in the campus marshes, we have, you see, the, uh, the synagogue. So we're in the, the Jewish ghetto. But of course, in antiquity, it wasn't the Jewish ghetto. The Jews lived on the other side of Tristevere. But this place here actually had a dozen such temples along the lines of which the crowd and the procession would proceed. One real standout right there at the southernmost part of this floodplain of Rome is the Theater of Marcellus. And it is one of the three theaters in ancient Rome. But why do we still have it? So on the one hand, we look at it as engineers and archaeologists, and we talk about how well it's built. And on the other hand, we talk about how it could be repurposed. So right in the seats there, there becomes constructed, right on top of it, a medieval fortification, which in time is transformed into a Renaissance palazzo. And finally today, still today, in the 21st century, people are living in it. But then take yourself back over 2,000 years, and people are going right through, right past that theater, and right past uh, re-erected columns after uh, intervention in the, again, the 1920s, blowing through neighborhoods of, of the medieval ages, making new roads and new arteries, and isolating monuments like this, the Forum Holatorum, which is actually now today called Santa Maria, uh, excuse me, uh, San Nicola in Carcere. So what happens is over time, things get repurposed or not. The central temple, one of three, is incorporated into the church. The other ones kind of just fall away, but then they're incorporated in other structures. So in our procession, we're following along. For hundreds of years, Romans were adding different kinds of monuments, celebrating that past, restoring that past, maintaining that past, until they don't. And when they don't, what's left behind can be incorporated into something, can be repurposed, can be stripped down, always taking on new meanings. Now we proceed over to the Forum Boarium. And that's an extraordinary place in ancient Roman times. Here your procession proceeds. You are the emperor, the general, your god for a day, but you're looking up to people like this, Hercules, who did become a god. And Hercules is, this is a, the Guild of Bronze statue, that's part of one of the temples that was found right there in the cattle market. Why? Because, you, because Hercules came there with cattle on one of his 12 labors. So even preceding the construction of Rome, this guy is really instrumental in the mind of the general. I'm going to achieve something great. I'm going to become immortal. And what's left behind are a number of temples, which we can see here uh, quite well. Two of them. The round temple is dedicated, one of four in the area dedicated to Hercules. The other one is a temple of Portunus, and Portunus is a god of the harbor, the port of Republican Rome. They're in great shape. Why are they in great shape? Because at a certain point, 7th century AD, they become churches, and then they get repurposed, and that material is not stripped down. They take on new meaning. They create new meaning. Today, they're um, no longer churches. They are archaeological sites that people walk by, but they're well-preserved because of funding, in this case, where monuments fund, pay for the restoration, and is taking care of these monuments. Across the street, the Arch of Janus needs help. It's going to get it very shortly. So what happens over time is these monuments 
are kind of isolated, they need, um, they need new help. Can you see that? OK, thank you. So everyone really makes a beeline in, the, in this part of the neighborhood today to Santa Maria and Cosmeden because they want to go here. They want to get their hand bitten off. So part of your Roman holiday, part of your travels as a tourist, you want to go to places that you can reach up and touch and experience. And that, for me, is one of the, the great things of living in Rome, is I can see and perceive and feel history every day. Look where we are right now. We're in the middle of history as well. I mean, I can see the tool marks from the, the cuttings that are made to, to dig out this quarry site. And that's something that you want to perceive, and that's something that, again, you going there and putting your hand into the Boca della Verità, a recycled piece of uh, sculpture from antiquity, it takes on new meaning, it takes on new meaning for you in that given moment. Um, our procession passes through the Circus Maximus, and the Circus Maximus, oops, held 250,000 people. So this is the ultimate venue of antiquity. What stadium, what of any sport, holds 250,000 people? It is here that you got the perspective of the captives, of the soldiers, of stage sets up to four stories high, of people that you know that are going to be executed, the cattle that will be sacrificed, the music, the pageantry. You really took it in here like no other place as this train is snaking its way through the city, going around the Palace of the Emperors on the Palatine Hill. So we'll take a left. We'll go here to an arch. We're getting familiar territory right by the Colosseum. Here's the Arch of Constantine, and up the way to the Arch of Titus. Why is this so well preserved? This one here is incorporated into medieval walls that when they are dismantled, the outer part of this arch celebrating the triumph of Titus has to be dismantled. But here we go. Here's our troops carrying the menorah, which was originally gilded. And on the other side, you have Titus himself and his four-horse chariot. There goes the triumph. And in antiquity, today they don't want you to walk through it for preservation purposes, but your, your procession, or you on a daily basis, going into the forum now, could pass right through and have a kind of visual effect of this, of this movement, of this, of this artwork. Down the Via Sacra, into the Roman Forum, and what do we see here? Well, it's a bit of a hodgepodge at this point. We imagine everything in full elevation, everything would be as tall as the, uh, the temple on the right. That's been converted into a church. The big brick building on the left in the distance is the Curia, the Senate House. It was converted into a church. That's why so many things are preserved in Rome. They've been repurposed when the Curia is stripped of being a church, and it's just this well-preserved archaeological monument today. And to the left of it is the Arch of Septimius Severus, which we see here, which is another triumphal arch. So what's happening over time is you're not just building temples along the route. You're building all kinds of structures, including this arch of Septimius Severus, through which subsequent people would pass through on their own triumph. Next to the arch is the car care of the prison, where the heads of state, if you're lucky to have some from your triumph, will be executed. It's converted into uh, a church, celebrating the Peter and Paul that were, according to medieval traditions, uh, put in prison there as well. And then up the Clevis Capitolinus to the Capitoline Hill. This is the end result uh, today, of course, it's been repurposed, and we have the beautiful Campidoglio Piazza of Michelangelo. But in ancient times, well, to get a sense of antiquity, you have to go into the Capitoline Museums, by the way, the world's oldest public museum, and you get your view of the foundation of the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus. Jupiter Optimus Maximus, the greatest, the best, the ultimate uh, expression of Jupiter, that's all we got left of it. Where did it go? Why didn't it get converted into a church? Because it's kind of the epitome of paganism. And the roof tiles were gilded bronze. And if you can imagine big roof tiles slathered in gold, covering an air of a football field, you understand why not everything from antiquity is preserved. It's getting stripped away and eventually rediscovered with uh, renovation in this very old uh, museum. So you get our view of, of Rome from here. We get our view of the Forum. This was the heart of the city. This is the place that maybe, again, coming back full circle with our, with our tourists that's coming into Rome. What are they seeing? What are they not seeing? What are they getting? How are they interpreting Rome? You know, how much are they getting out of going to the Colosseum versus how much for this history? This is the commercial center, the economic center, the religious center, political center of ancient Rome. It's all right here. Now, let's turn back a little bit to the initial part of the conversation so I can conclude which is, 
what am I, what am I doing with, uh, with this conversation online? I was asked to talk a little bit about this. Well, if you're living and you're immersed in history and you're an educator and you want to reach out to a lot of people and talk about issues of reuse, recycling, preservation, I mean, Rome is easy because it's like the most sustainable city that ever existed. It's still there. It's still occupied. And we can talk about it in different uh, platforms and in different ways. So here's uh, live streaming with a bunch of people saying, yeah, I'll go on a bike ride with you as you bike around uh, Casa San Angelo. There's a playground now at the bottom. My kids like to play there, kind of tool around, but we're live streaming you know, on a bike. Um, and sometimes, obviously, it's more serious. Collaboration here with the uh, Capitoline Museums, the uh, Notele Museo, great opportunity. Let's have a conversation. I mean, the bottom line is, I mean, kind of, you know, again, getting into the conclusion, is you have so much history here too in Matera. And there have been ups and downs, periods of abandonment, periods in which people are, are renovating and there are new ideas and new energy. How do you sustain that? Part of what you can do is extend that conversation. Amongst yourselves, I mean, it was obviously the most important thing is being here, seeing here, perceiving it. I'm getting a real sense of the city because I'm here. But what you can do then with these different kinds of platforms, people are really excited. People do want to learn. And, you know, using these kinds of platforms, spending the time to engage, your conversation will go further. Here's a project with the Vatican Museums. Uh, the patrons of the Vatican, they wanted to uh, have people know about a new app called Patreon App, which basically uh, lends support to conservation projects in the Vatican. They too need to be sustainable. They too need help. And that was a great opportunity to go through the Vatican empty. So it's an empty museo uh, participation and also live streaming, looking at what the conservatives are doing and talking about these issues. Because guess what? Most people don't think conservation and restoration is sexy, but it has to be. And part of the way in which we can, can bridge that is bringing other people in the conversation besides just the professionals that can talk about it in a certain angle. There's a whole bunch of people that can participate to, to have more conversation, have more excitement. So I leave you with this thought. Think about, it doesn't matter where you are because history is everywhere. What does it mean to you? What do you want to do with history? How do you want to reutilize it? How do you want it to be part of your history? And in the end, it's all part of our collective past. What are you going to do to protect our past for the future? Thank you.